Well, hello everyone, and thank you very much for coming out to, to this uh, Royal Society of Arts events on how to change the post-crash economy. My name is Ben Chu. I'm the economics editor of The Independent. Um, uh, first of all, if everyone could switch off their mobile phones, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, this is, event is being uh, webcast live, um, and there's also a Twitter hashtag, which is RSA Economy. So feel free to tweet, uh, those of you in the room, and also those of you watching online. Um, there is a real sense that despite the fact that we're experiencing recovery now in the UK, that there is something structurally wrong with our economy and also the economies uh, throughout the Western world. Uh, real wages are under massive pressure, investment is low, there is a sense of a cost of living crisis, that rapacious oligopolies are, are, uh, are pushing, down, uh, the cost of li uh, pushing down living standards, uh, unemployment is still elevated, and these are all uh, issues we're going to talk about tonight and we're going to look at why it's happened and also what to do about it. Now we've got a fantastic panel here today. Um, Kostas Lapovitsas is the Professor of Economics at SOAS. Uh, he's also written a new book which uh, uh, to, deals with a lot of the issues through a Marxist perspective, Marxist theoretical perspective, which is really an analy analysis which has been not penetrated the mainstream debate and he's, I think he's the man to change that. We've got Paul Mason, uh, who, who many of you will remember from Newsnight, many of his dispatches from the front line, um, <coughs> looking at the, uh, the, uh, the impact of our dysfunctional economy very up close. Um, and he's now culture and digital editor of Channel 4 News. We have Maria, Mariana Matsukato, who is the RM Phillips Professor in Economics of Innovation at Sussex University, and she really wrote one of the best books uh, on economics last year uh, called The Entrepreneurial State. Uh, look, um, taking on the debunking the myth that the, the, the state is basically a drag on growth and we just need to let the private sector do its thing. Um, we've got Seamus Milne, the Guardian columnist and author. Um, he's really a man who's, who regularly uh, attacks the political economy uh, that we have and he's the man to uh, take on the orthodoxies tonight. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let each of our speakers speak for five minutes outlining their view on uh, on what's gone wrong and how to fix it um, and sort of looking at uh, looking at it from their various uh, specialist perspectives then we're going to have a, a brief interplay looking at uh, discussing what they've said and then uh, we're going to throw it open to the audience to your questions um, great so I think uh, we'll start with Costas um, so Costas if you'd like to tell us for about five minutes what your view is I will try. Five minutes is not that long, but I'll do my best. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to um, address this audience, and I'd like to thank the uh, RSA for organizing this uh, remarkable event. And I hope that the um, exchange of ideas here will be productive and useful for all of us. Um, I haven't got very much time, as I've already said, so I'll come to the point um, straight away. And I would say that uh, the structural problems to which um, Ben referred just a few minutes ago uh, have to do with the financialization of contemporary mature capitalism. This is where I see uh, the structural problems uh, residing, and this is what I've argued in this uh, new book of mine. M mature contemporary capitalism has financialized. Uh, and I want to tell you a few things about what I think this is. Now, we can all easily see the extraordinary rise of finance uh, in the modern economy in this country, in the United States, but also in Japan, Germany, uh, and elsewhere. There's no doubt at all about the rise of finance in size, penetration across economy and society, and influence on policy. Now, is this financialization, though? Is it simply the rise of finance? No, I would say. That's not uh, what financialization is, although that is a fundamental part of it. I would argue that financialization is, represents a historic transformation of um, mature capitalism, and uh, it does so in uh, three uh, key ways. And they have to be understood uh, in order to appreciate where we are. I would argue then, first of all, that we must start with uh, not the financial system, but with commercial and industrial enterprises. We must start with big business, if you like, the industrial and commercial enterprises that provide the backbone of the productive economy, and there we will find financialization. It starts there. We find big businesses actually relying less and less on banks to finance investment, possessing huge amounts of cash through, through retained profits, and using those monies 
to engage in financial uh, transactions, to play games, to extract financial profits. They have become, to a certain extent, financialized themselves. That's where, that's where the problem starts, because that has implications for their internal structure, for how they see investment, for how they organize their own affairs. That's the first uh, tendency. The second tendency of financialization has to do with the banks. Since big business have done, uh, has gone, undergone this transformation, banks themselves have transformed themselves. Uh, if you can do less business with uh, the big industrials and commercials, then you seek other uh, activities if you're a bank. And banks have sought other activities in financial markets, playing games in financial markets, transacting in financial assets, and making profits, not out of lending and out of the normal business of banking, the traditional business of banking, but out of financial market transactions, fees, commissions, profits from transacting on own account, and so on. Banks have also turned to households, and that's a striking aspect of financialization. Uh, households have emerged as a key area uh, of financialization. That's the third uh, tendency, if you like. Why have households financialized? All of us in this country uh, know exactly and instinctively what I mean. All of us have become increasingly implicated into the formal financial system, both uh, for debt, but also for assets. It isn't just debt. It's also assets for pensions, for insurance, um, and so on. Why has that happened? Now, one element here is that wages have not grown very fast. In, in some countries, not at all. In the United States, they've been stagnant for decades. So people have supplemented stagnant wages uh, with borrowing. That's clear. But actually, I would argue it's deeper than that. It isn't simply, I don't make enough money uh, through my wages, therefore I will borrow. It's actually more complex than that. What, I, what is happening, and you can see it in this country, is that households have met their basic needs for housing, for health, for education, um, for pensions, and so on, to a large extent through public provision, mechanisms of pub public provision during the last uh, several decades after the war. It's been characteristic of this country for many decades. What, what, what started to happen in the 70s, 80s, and 90s is that public provision retreated, private provision took its place, and private provision has been mediated by finance. Financialization then, private finance has emerged as the mediator of this process, and we've all become more indebted and more reliant on the financial system for our assets. We have become then a field of profitability for banks and other financial institutions. What are the outcomes of this? This financialization of capitalism, which I would, uh, the, the beginning of which I would locate in the 70s, has resulted in a system that is, first of all, deeply unequal. Inequality has increased in an extraordinary way the last uh, three to four decades. We are back to levels that were seen in the 20s uh, and in the 30s. All the gains made in the 50s and 60s have been lost. Uh, in the equality gains, and we're back to a deeply unequal uh, regime. It's a system that has also been socially transformed. The powerful layers, social layers that have emerged, are not only the owners of capital, but also those who are well located and positioned in relation to the financial system. They are key bankers, key advisors, and other players of the financial system, key people who can make a profit by being connected to the financial system. It's a, it's a new a uh, layer of people who can draw extraordinary incomes, often in the form of wages and salaries. They're not at all wages and salaries, they're actually profits, but they appear as wages and salaries um, because, of, because of relation to the financial system. These people uh, also play a key role in shaping policy, absolutely key role in shaping economic uh, and other policy. Finally, this is a deeply unstable uh, system. It isn't just unequal, it isn't just uh, socially transformed, it's also deeply unstable because it contains finance across its structure. And finance, as we know, is a deeply unstable mechanism in capitalist economies. It tends naturally to create bubbles and naturally to create um, crises when these bubbles burst. And we, we saw the biggest one in 2007, 2009. Now, I haven't got much time. No, if you can. Uh, I'm going to bring it to an end. <laughs> what can be done about this? I will come clean and I'll, I'll tell you straight away that obviously it's a matter of regulating finance, obviously. Regulation is important, but regulation alone is not enough. We've had plenty of regulation over the last um, three to four decades. It's been toothless regulation, regulation designed by the banks 
for the banks. We need <coughs> different regulation, regulation with teeth that would actually restrain the financial system, but regulation alone is not enough. The financial system will always find ways of bypassing regulation. What we also need to confront head on is the question of ownership of assets, key assets in the economy, and public policy generally. And I would argue that if financialization is as deeply rooted as I've argued it is, we need to consider ownership with regard an intervention with regard to commercial and industrial enterprises. We need public ownership in those fields. Uh, we need to consider what this means for organizing production and for investment and so on. I repeat, in the area of real activity, we need to consider, to consider ownership for banking, public ownership, not simply nationalizing the banks and providing them with money, but running them as public enterprises with a new spirit of uh, public service and with a public mandate. And we need these banks to support investment uh, and activity uh, of households and others across the economy. And we need to consider public mechanisms of provision for households. We need to reconsider uh, public mechanisms for, house, for, for housing, for health, for education, and for all these areas that um, are so important to housing. In other words, to, to, to households. In other words, we need a broad program uh, of restructuring the economy as a whole a program of reversing financialization, which I would argue is inherently anti-capitalist. Uh, that is the kind of program we need. That is what we expect uh, political parties to begin to uh, offer to us. And the sooner we start debating, uh, uh, debating it along those lines, um, the better we will all be. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Kostas. That was nice. Ad admirably uh, wide-ranging there and also in its prescriptions. Now, Mariana, do you, do you agree with that? What, perhaps you'd like to give us your take on, on the question. Okay, so I think the first point is that there has not been a paucity of critiques, right? I mean, everyone has talked about how bad the system is. There's all sorts of talk about you know, how financialized it is. All these words like rent seekers, speculators, or what was Miliband's word, the predators versus the productive capitalists, you know, from right to left, there's been plenty of critiques. And I think that the reason why it's had so little effect, um, so I'm looking at my time, I can barely see that, okay, good, um, is that these critiques, which in the end are about value extraction, right, that somehow these extractors have, you know, gotten away with uh, murder, has not actually been related to a theory of value creation. And until you do that, your critique will be weak, it will have no effect. And you know, just empirically why it's having no effect. I mean, what, Goldman Sachs made record level profits this year, uh, share buybacks, you know, which is one of the main proxies for how financialized the real economy is, are completely on the rise, right? Apple, which actually never did any share buybacks under uh, Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, this is basically his new great business plan. Um, uh, one hedge fund made uh, billions out of the Greek crisis, right? And, you know, and all this is accepted, and it's and it's all getting worked. Ex um, executive pay, which was you know a big concern, especially for those uh, fighting the whole one percent, ninety-nine percent inequality, that's still going out of the roof, right? So so little has changed, and this is not because there haven't been enough critiques. So I kind of want to focus on that issue there: how to start really relating these critiques which are about value extraction and have actually you know, touched on really important issues, how to make them much more forceful. And the first thing I think that's really important is, so what I do is I do sort of economics of innovation, I talk to lots of policymakers, and uh, just some background here, you know, one of the ways that I think things have been misunderstood is that, and I think the book is excellent on this, it kind of says it from the beginning, is that we often think it's you know big bad finance, credit default swaps, derivatives eh, against the real economy, and this poor real economy is being starved. So what do we need to do? You know, finance it, whether it's through innovation policy. These are the kind of guys I speak to, or forcing uh, companies, uh, sorry, banks actually lend the money. Um, the problem is that the real economy, right, the industry the pharmaceutical companies, the IT companies, the biotech companies, the clean technology companies of today are just as financialized and just as sick as the banks. Okay, and I'm going to come back to that at the end. Um, and so how to think about both that problem, right, which is how to definancialize the real economy, not just think it's the big bad banks against industry, but also do what I was saying at the beginning, which is actually relate this critique about value extraction to value creation, I think really has to start going to the, uh, how do you say, pillars of where the problem is. So take, for example, this problem about share buybacks, right? So this is 
hugely problematic. Lots of people are talking about it. Just to give you some numbers, in the last 10 years, the Fortune 500 companies have spent $3 trillion uh, worth on share buybacks. Top companies today in all the both high-tech sectors as well as medium-tech sectors are often spending uh, more money on share buybacks than on areas like research and development, human capital formation, which we know actually causes long-run growth. Amgen, you know, a biotech company, which we're often told is, you know, one of the new economy type companies for the last 10 years has spent more money on share buybacks than on R&D except one year, 2004. Um, now, just complaining about that is not going to do anything. In fact, it's only getting worse. As I said, some companies like Apple that never did them is all of a sudden doing them. The reason why they're doing them, right, is because of this whole shareholder value, if you want, ideology. And again, you don't just say, oh, that's wrong. You say, well, what is it actually based on? What are the assumptions underneath that ideology? And if you actually go and read, you know, Michael Jensen, who is this Harvard Business School professor who kind of, well, I don't want to say he made it up, but he kind of popularized it, it actually has a theory of, you know, a very strong theory of where value comes from. And his idea and the whole sort of ideology behind it is that the shareholders are the biggest risk takers. Everyone else has a guaranteed rate of return. Okay, so once the workers are paid, once the bank loans are paid off, if there happens to be a residual, something left over, right, so after the biotech boom, there was a lot left over, after the whole dot-com investments, there was a lot left over, well, they kind of deserve it, because they risk, you know, getting nothing. And so then you ask yourself, well, who actually invested? Who actually did create the value that led to the internet? This is, you know, the kind of stuff I write about in my book in terms of who actually created the value behind the whole Silicon Valley model. Well, it was often the taxpayers, right? I mean, every technology behind the iPhone that makes it smart was government funded. Um, and there was no guaranteed rate of return. When the government funded the internet, and the internet was almost fully funded, actually it was completely funded by government, as was GPS, um, <coughs> the touchscreen display, even the Siri thing on the, on the, uh, on the iPhone, there's no guaranteed rate of return. Just like when Obama just recently funded Tesla Motors, which is the new big uh, hero in Silicon Valley, you know, there was huge risk. That actually paid off. Now Tesla is making billions. It paid off for Tesla, but Solyndra, which, you know, the government also backed, completely failed, right? So there's no guaranteed rate of return. For every internet, you have nine concords, is how I often put it. And so the point is, that is a lie. It's just not true that the shareholders are the ones who are taking the biggest risks, and they're the residual claimants and the only ones without a guaranteed rate of return. But the only way to really attack that model is attacking this concept of who the risk takers are, who the value creators are. Same thing with sort of smaller type companies, right, because these are the very large companies that are often doing their share buybacks. The whole, again, kind of Silicon Valley new entrant model, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Amazons, um, you know, they got, they, we like to think that they got the money from these venture capitalists, but actually lots of that early stage funding, as I said, actually came from the taxpayers. And what's very interesting, though, is that in 1976, okay, when the venture capitalists actually got together as a lobby, right, the National Venture Capital Association, the first thing they did was lobby for what? Capital gains tax to fall, which has actually been one of the key drivers of inequality in both the U.S. and the U.K., and that was done with, again, a story about who the value creators are, and the idea is, you know, you want a new economy, a knowledge economy, you want innovation, you want that kind of, you know, uh, smart growth that everyone talks about today, well, then reduce our capital gains tax, and they managed to reduce it by 50 percent in five years. So in 1981 already it was 20 percent. In the UK it was Gordon Brown, the Labour Party, that reduced the time that private equity has to be invested from 10 years to two years. You know, and also in this country, VC, venture capital and private equity aren't even differentiated, which here has made you know, that type of financing even more short-termist. And so the point is that these things have actually evolved over time through a story about, you know, who are the innovators, who are on the entrepreneurs, who are the important kind of risk takers. And yes, it will, you know, produce a bit of inequality, but in the end, that's also what kind of drives the system because these are the, you know, the geniuses, the ones who really risk their butts while everyone else had this guaranteed kind of, you know, salary. Um, and I don't want to say much more than that, except just to, fi to finish with just a line, which is that one of the biggest critiques that was actually made to the financial sector after all the bailouts was, you know, socialization of risk, uh, privatization of rewards. Well, that critique is just as true for the real economy, for all the reasons I just said, right? You know, we, we invest in the really hard stuff, the really uncertain, the 
the high risk areas and then once the profits come, just like today again, Tesla Motors, it's in the news and all the newspapers today, front page, the billions that they're making. Well, what happened there when the early stage you know, seed investment actually came from government, the taxpayers get very little back. In Silicon Valley, public school system is a complete ghettoized school system today. And that is like the biggest insult for an area that just received so much government money, which actually created the wave that these new economy companies actually uh, you know, made billions off of. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mariana. Uh, next, we're going to go to Paul Mason, who I think is going to talk about the role of digital and technology in, in all this. Paul. Thank you, um, and thanks to the other uh, speakers, and it's a pleasure to be uh, on the platform with them. Um, Keynes once said, money is a link to the future. And what he meant is the way we use money today is a signal of what we think the future is going to be. I think it, it, it's implicit that it's a two-way link. And we found that in 2008 when money sent a signal back from the future about what was not going to happen. Because we had been, as Costas describes in, his, in his, his and his school that he's part of, theory of financialization, is we had been using money as if it could create itself. In a pure way, as if assets could create their own value, um, independent of, um, of the value creating activities of, of, of people. And um, what that, you know, really 2008 for me was a signal that um, all the assumptions implicit in three now, three, because the quantitative easing bubble is also a bubble. So we had dot-com, we had property, and now we have a bubble in, in government bonds. In, these bubbles are simply um, are, uh, the false uh, message uh, that we've been giving to ourselves that, that we can just go and creating money out of nothing. Now, I think the role of information technology in what's going on is really fundamental in the sense that, yes, I think, and I've written in one of my books, that what happened in 2008 was the end of a 50-year cycle, the kind of delayed and, and shocking end of a 50-year um, long cycle of capitalism. But it's more than that. I think I, I more and more come to the conclusion that we are at the stage, a, a kind of a third age of, of capitalism, in the sense that we had the, the, the mercantile and financial um, capitalism of the 17th and 18th centuries. We had 19th and 20th century industrial capital. And what have we got now? Information technology does, I think, two important things. First of all, it destroys the price mechanism, as understood by classical economics. That is, information goods cannot be priced um, through a mechanism unless you create an absolute monopoly around them, because they are infinitely, infinitely copyable and pasteable. Walras, the founder of, of classical economics, says, you know, all goods are scarce. Well, I'm sorry, iTunes are not scarce. It is possible, theoretically, for every single one of us to own every iTunes in existence, except we wouldn't need to own them. We could simply share them, and the cost of them would not be 99p each. 99p is a product of an absolute monopoly. Apple has something like 95% of online, online um, music revenue. Um, so, look, Paul Romer in 1990 basically says that information technology is destroying the price mechanism. It is driving the price of information goods towards zero unless you have a monopoly. That's the first thing that, that InfoTech is doing. The second thing it is doing is it is creating automation. I think it was the Oxford Internet School said in a study last year, it is likely that by 2035, I think, 47% um, of American service jobs will be automated. That is, they will not exist. Um, receptionist, office admin, uh, retail jobs. The, the most common jobs in America, office admin and retail, will be gone. So what does this do? For me, it, it, it complements the, the, the insights of the financialization school, which have described to us what happens when you need to have growth to deliver social stability, but you cannot have wage growth. The reason you can't have wage growth is because the price of the inputs is falling, so the price of everything that goes into wages, i.e. the things we consume to go to work, um, falls. And the price of labor falls because the workforce is massively expanded and it is increasingly, um, the demand for labor will fall because of autom automation. So all that, that has led me to the following conclusion, that the, this third information age is real. That the internet, as uh, French economist Jan Moulier Boutang says, is both the ocean and the galleon of the new El Dorado. It is both the way we get there and it is what we find when we get there. 
The only problem is it's not El Dorado. There is no value out there. Um, and that the information economy will, like, will and is in the process of coming, up, coming about, but it will, cannot be a market economy. I think if we start from there, a lot, of the solu a lot of the problems about the left and its absence of solutions begin to dissolve. That is the problem with the left in the 20, late 20th century and the early 21st century is they thought there was a sequence, free market capitalism, organized capitalism, my state monopoly, you know, in the early 20th century, Keynesianism, all organized, and then this thing came along after 1989. It disorganized everything and it's all very free. Well, uh, therefore, what do we do? I would argue, though I take your point on the need to socialize, their, um, you know, Minsky, one of the great theorists of financial crisis, says this, socialize the banking system. I think it's not all. We have to look at the emergent new non-market forms that are coming out of, spontaneously, out of the information economy, which are peer-to-peer -peer production, non-managed production, modular production, non-profit production. Wikipedia, um, long, its demise long predicted, but not actually happening, um, it's, if it were a real business, would, would, would turn over three billion, uh, one on one estimate, a year. It's not like Amazon, 70 billion, but it's still a lot. Um, the reason why you can't have a, a private capitalist Wikipedia is because Wikipedia exists. The reason why you can't have a private capitalist Linux, which runs half the servers in the world, is because Linux exists. And ditto Apache, ditto everything else that is free because it has been created in the spare time of people, um, that is the great dissolver, that is the great solvent, I argue, of the market system. Now the question is where does that free time of people come from? It comes from the fact what you describe, I think, really well in the book, that the way we are exploited in modern society is no longer directly through production. It is through production, but I know work for a private company, uh, uh, left the BBC and joined one that has shareholders and annual reports. And um, I'm pretty sure that the amount of surplus which is extracted from my labour is not as much as the amount of surplus that is extracted from my credit card as a percentage term. That is that I create two value streams for capitalism at least and possibly more. The other one is through my consumption. Um, and it, because we are now producing, consuming and doing all kinds of other stuff that create revenue streams for capitalists, um, I, I think the final thing is where's the opposition? I think it is no logical to say something that the Italian autonomists said way in advance of it being true. That is that we are in a social factory. The factory, the, the factory of the 21st century is this room, the Nike shop, the, the online store purchase, yes, the real factories, it, it, everywhere is, this, is the arena of our exploitation and therefore everywhere can, and I would argue have, has become the arena of opposition to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, adding a valuable new dimension to what we've been talking about. Uh, finally, let's go to Seamus and uh, get his thoughts on this big question. Thanks, Ben, and thanks for inviting me to it. So it's a privilege to be on the panel um, uh, with so many uh, very insightful um, writers. I mean, I'm just going to pick up really from where um, Paul left off about the politics of the post-crash economy, maybe. I mean, because... Now, for 30 years, we were told that only the neoliberal model, the financialized neo neo neoliberal model, was the way to run a prosperous modern economy. Uh, for you know, a whole generation or more, we were told that only uh, free trade, privatization, deregulation um, and, uh, was, was the way to produce an effective modern economy that would deliver for the population. And, of course, that had already been seen to fail before the crash of 2008. You know, far from delivering for the majority of people, it delivered slower growth, uh, much greater inequality, um, much greater levels of poverty, uh, corporate power, uh, damage to the environment, re reduction in workers' rights, slow wage growth or even real wage decline for many people even in the advanced, wo in the advanced capitalist world. Um, and, of course, that was being said by many people, particularly, say, in the anti-corporate movement in the 90s, long before uh, the crash of 2008. And it's also the case that 
the economists who predicted that this model that we've been talking about today, this economic model, would lead to a debt crisis and a crash, were overwhelmingly from the political left. It's not exclusively, but overwhelmingly the case. Uh, and nevertheless, the left, the political left in its broad sense, has been incredibly um, slow to capitalize on that vindication. You're just now starting to see in the academic world a revolt among students in, in this country and elsewhere against the teaching of uh, neoclassical economics in its most crude and um, ineffective form and the desire for a broader um, kind of uh, range of economic uh, theories to be taught to them. Now, it's also the case that throughout that period that the elites of all the main political parties, not only in Britain but throughout the Western world in particular, preached light touch regulation of the financial system. Gordon Brown, who we heard about a moment ago, he claimed that boom and bust had been abolished. Um, economists like Robert Le Lucas said that uh, there had been a great moderation and there was going to be no more of this um, uh, capitalist trade cycle in the way it's traditionally understood. And Alan Greenspan, who was the high priest of financial deregulation, uh, had to admit before um, the uh, a Congress committee and US Congress committee in 2009 that his view of the world um, had been proved to be wrong. Uh, and of course in that he was only catching up with what the critics of neoliberalism had been saying uh, for decades. So it's clear that the, the crash of 2008 um, discredited and showed the neoliberal model to have failed and financialization as the form that it's taken in the most recent period is, is broken. It seemed to be discredited. But as other people on the panel have been saying and as much discussed, nevertheless, that since that has taken, since that crash of the crash and the crisis that we're living through the aftermath of today, there has been a consistent drive to try and refloat that model via austerity, renewed privatization, more deregulation. And that's, I think, for many people, not only sort of baffling, but obviously frustrating and deeply uh, damaging. And I think, you know, part of the explanation for that is that if, neoliberal, if neoliberalism was just a theory of economic management, it, would have be, it wouldn't be taken seriously. It would be entirely discredited and discarded. But of course, it's not just a, a theory of economic management. It's also a system of social power and economic interests which have enormous power and people who and the people who stand behind that have an enormous potential loss in that being dismantled and I, I'm not just talking about in the t in terms of the actual running of the economy or finance but also in the fact that and and this is something that's not that much discussed in Britain but that that through the direct uh, corruption of the political process of academia of think tanks uh, of uh, NGOs by the corporate, in corporate interests, which you know, directly benefit from the system that does not benefit um, the large majority of people. Now, in relation to the post-crash model, um, the historian Eric Hobsbawm, who died uh, 18 months ago, um, said in his last book that the crash of 2008 was the, equi the right wing's equivalent of the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, for the left. And the objection to that that's often made is that the left has no systemic alternative in the wake of the failure or the, the, the erosion of the old Keynesian social democratic uh, model and the uh, communism that, uh, the, the communist system that operated in the 20th century. And, and my answer to that would be that no economic or social model ever came pre-cooked, that all of them uh, whether it's the Soviet one, the Keynesian social democratic model, or even the Thatcher uh, Reaganite um, economic model, um, the, the, which effectively is neoliberalism and, and became financialized neoliberalism, grew out of an ideologically driven improvisation in particular historical cir circumstances. And I think that we're going to see the same um, in the aftermath of the crisis of neoliberalism and the neoliberal model that we're living through um, today. Because the, the need to reconstruct a broken economy on a more democratic, egalitarian and rational basis is clearly already beginning to dictate 
the shape of a sustainable um, alternative. And I agree with what else has been said on the panel that you know that needs to include um, a strong role for social ownership, public intervention, a basic shift in um, in the the balance of wealth and power and there needs of course to be much more work although a lot of it's been done already in fact on how those forms of intervention and those forms of reconstruction of a socially controlled economy in the 21st century um, needs to take place but I, I don't think the problem is so much that the detailed worked out alternatives of how a different kind of economic model can operate in the 21st century hasn't been done. I think the, the, the much greater problem is the social and political weight um, to turn that into reality. And just to finish, I mean, I, I know some people are more pessimistic about that than others, but um, and, and notice that Costas' last article that he wrote for The Guardian um, seem to me to be uh, to have uh, lost the confidence in in that process but I think there clearly are signs not only in Britain but throughout um, the advanced capitalist world and far beyond that that change is already beginning to take place I mean I'd point to what Mariana referred to in relation to um, you know Ed Miliband's attempts to try and um, talk about a different kind of um, economic model and, uh, and predators and predatory capitalism and so on. Uh, even though those moves may be very timid, um, I think you can, point, you can see that what's happening, for example, in Germany and France in the remunicipalization or return to social ownership of basic um, utilities like uh, and, and energy supply, gas and, um, and electricity and power um, and water. And then, of course, you know, in the whole process that's taken place in Latin America in the last 10 years, uh, where there's an attempt to um, take back so economic resources from corporate control and build a new kind of um, economic uh, model for the 21st century is taking place. So I think the process is in play, um, and some of the things that we've heard about today are already being turned into reality, but the, the thing that's really missing is the social and political weight to overcome the interests that stand behind a model that has quite obviously failed for the majority of people. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Seamus, and thank you for injecting a slightly more hopeful note. Um, <laughs> if I was playing devil's advocate, Costas, and if I was from a free market think tank such as the Institute for Economic Affairs, etc., I might say, whatever, however valid some of your critiques of the way the capitalism is working are, what you're proposing, moving away from a market system, that cure is worse than the disease itself. How would you respond to that kind of, uh, of attack? Um, I would say a number of things with regard to that. The first point to establish is that neoliberalism, which has characterized the, the, the thinking behind many of these positions, um, is actually very religious in its outlook. It's almost like a religious belief. Uh, market is good, state is bad. This is how it appears, right? Market good, state bad. Private good, public bad. And almost, but th there is no good theory that actually proves this uh, in general. There's none. But actually, neoliberalism, when you think about it again more deeply, is not about that. That's the first stage, really. The, deepest, the deeper aspect of neoliberalism is we need to capture the state to put in place what we think ought to be happening uh, in terms of market and economy. The, 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 the real neoliberals, the deeper ones, know very well that they need to capture the state. Right. So the argument about state, public policy, and so on is understood by neoliberals too. They want to take over the state, but not to use it, not to use the public aspect in the way that I just advocated. Now, do we need to replace the market with a system in which every last button in this country or any other country is produced by a public uh, mechanism? No. We don't need the last restaurant and the last hairdresser and the last barbers to be run by the state. No, that's not the argument. Um, uh, that, that has been resolved for, for, for a very long time. What we need is a system of public ownership and public intervention and, 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 and sort of public concerns and a public mandate mm -hmm. uh, to take over uh, key areas of the economy. I don't think this is really in debate anymore. It's so obvious that 
private enterprise has failed in so many ways, particularly when it comes to banking. Private, what's the purpose of private banking? I, I don't, I mean, what do they offer to the economy? Right? So it is so clear that, that we need a public uh, aspect to the economy, uh, run in a pub new public spirit, and uh, with, a, with a new public mandate that seems to me un unanswerable. The last point that I want to make on this is this. That doesn't mean one agent running all public mechanisms in this country. When I say public, I just mean non-private. We need new associational, communal, uh, and various other forms of organization uh, of the economy. This is the old spirit of socialism. Socialism was never about transforming everything into one big factory. I mean, it took certain forms in the 20th century which were deeply problematic. Uh, so um, I would defend that argument in this way, and I think history shows that um, there's a lot of strength okay, to it. Great. Yeah. Um, going from the uh, general to the specific, Mariana, you talk about Apple tonight and also in your book. And in your vision of a properly functional economy, mm -hmm. say Apple had those surpluses which it didn't know how to invest or it couldn't see a profitable return from, what, what, what would it happen? Would they, would they be more enlightened and therefore invest or would they never have those surpluses in the first place? What would be your specific view of, of you know, a company which had more money than it knew what to do with? Mm -hmm. How would that play out? Can I answer that? After I just sure. say something really quickly in support of what he, of what Acostas was just saying, because I'm sort of dying to say it, sorry. I've been recently looking at state investment banks around the world, so public financial institutions that used to be called development banks, but they're actually just kind of state investment banks. And if you look at the emerging green economy, so it actually comes in then to your Apple question, if you take all of private finance, everything, right? So this is private equity, venture capital, stock market financing, and corporate investments, and add it up, in the year 2012, that amounted to $12.5 billion for renewable energy. You then just take these five state investment banks that are incredibly active um, in basically doing everything that these private banks aren't doing, which is counter-cyclical spending, the capital development of the economy, using uh, Minsky's words, which is basically infrastructure, but also the next big thing after the internet, which is this kind of emerging, let's just call it green revolution, even though that's a problematic word. So uh, KFW, the German public bank, um, the China Development Bank, which is the most active bank out there right now, public bank, the Brazilian Development Bank, and the EIB, so four actually, you add up $80 billion worth. I mean, you know, exponential difference. And this is the point that, I mean, you know, coming to the question of why do we even have these private banks? Well, it's a big question, but the problem is we have no framework through which to talk about what these public banks are doing, and they are under massive attack. Attack in the same way, by the way, that the BBC is under attack when it's said to be, you know, crowding out private finance and that the people who are making that argument say, oh, but of course, you know, it would be too subjective to talk about the quality of the programs. We economists can't talk about that. That's, you know, we'll hold that constant. Well, what? You're going to hold constant the quality of the BBC programs when you talk about the BBC crowding out Fox or whatever? It's mad, but that's exactly what's happening to these banks. They are under attack. And so on the one hand, there's all this great stuff. You're like, oh my God, you know, public finance is rising up precisely because private finance has retreated, but they are bum, bum, bum. And in those same countries, by the way, so in Brazil, there's an election coming and the right, not only just the right, I mean, also the, the a bit, you know, worried uh, third way type left are, you know, very worried about this very active BNDS development bank that is, you know, just also very successful, 21% return on equity. I mean, this also comes back to the socialization of risk and socialization of rewards. 21% return on equity is what this particular state investment bank is making. The Treasury takes most of it and reinvests it back into the economy. Anyway, just quickly then on Apple, because I don't want to answer too much here. I mean, this is the issue. One of the issues is why is it that you even have this massive amounts of profits when actually innovation is a collective process, right? So if you do have this narrative, which is then fed into policy, where instead of talking about the collective actors that have actually led to that kind of technology, where by collective I mean the state, hence taxpayers, and in the same way it's cost us by state, I don't mean the Ministry of Innovation in the US, I mean about 20 different agencies, which I talk about in my book, which are all public agencies which led to that kind of technology. Unless you have that narrative and that story which policymakers are buying into, then they are completely captured and have come up with these policies which have made, allowed these companies to make you know, it's not that they don't deserve profit. Of course, they should be a profitable company. Steve Jobs was, in many ways, a genius, but it's just completely in excess compared to what they've actually put in. And these policies then that come out, like all this innovation policy, which is all of a sudden back into fashion, which on, on the one hand, I'm happy about. However, it's actually feeding the sick system by, you know, um, 
uh, just throwing money, say, at the pharmaceutical companies instead of asking them to reform. Mm. So what you should have is a proper life sciences strategy, which is, you know, this country has right now, is saying, okay, we will be spending more through the MRC, the Medical Research Council, but you, Pfizer, will actually reinvest your damn profits into R&D, into human capital formation, so we actually have the real kind of symbiotic uh, public-private partnerships instead of these parasitic ones where we just simply don't have today the Xerox parks and the Bell Labs. These were private companies that really were co-investing alongside the state. They don't exist in the green economy. Mm. Energy companies today are the top share buybackers. Mm. And you don't have courageous politicians saying this, so all we have is, you know, throwing money and, you know, okay, oh, you know, you want more. And, of course, they, they need more precisely because private finance is retreating, but you don't have a courageous state saying, and what kind of business do we want? A business that reinvests its profits into yeah. these long-run areas. So, so in a, in a well-functioning economy, those surpluses would, A, be smaller, and, B, uh, uh, managements would be more inclined to spend them because they would be... Well, yeah, but also they wouldn't be rewarded for doing the share yeah. buybacks. And so what we have today is they do that, and then they also get these massive, uh, you know, tax cuts <laughs> at the same time, okay. um, almost as a reward for... You know, so it's a policy for behaving in a particular way. I want, I want to go to Paul. You said in your in your talk um, that you want to you think the solution is to move away from the mentality of having a market economy uh, as a reflex. But you also said something interesting about we're in a third stage and a third and a bubble stage. Uh, would you like to hazard a guess on when that bubble is going to go pop? Well, I, I just said there was a, th a third bubble, uh, which is which is the QE bubble. It won't go pop. If you speak to people in the markets, they say the only risk in the market is political risk. Mm. Markets aren't markets. There's no, predictive, there's no market dynamic going on. Mm. It's simply that the world is awash with seven trillion of printed money and an endless guarantee um, to, to, and as you describe, it's a financialized economy. So if somebody says money is free, um, and in fact, it, it, it's not just free, it's, it costs you it costs you to save. If you want to be your savers, we're all of a certain age here, I think a lot of us. If you're trying to save, it costs you money, okay? Um, but if you have money, it's not free, and profits, is fr profits are free as well because QE is pumping money into the financial economy. That's a bubble. Um, uh, it, the reason it can't go on forever is the same reason as the others can't. Uh, I think people are becoming quite au fait, actually. There's a lot of expert opinion. Some of it is on this, this platform that is full of diagnosis of what is wrong. But... For me, one of the low-hanging fruits of what to do for you know, a, a kind of renewed social democracy would be this thing that concerns what Costas talked about, about the state. Um, it's not only that it can become entrepreneurial, as you describe, in terms of innovation. It is that the, the only thing the neoliberal state does is to rip away the public. Or that's, that's its job. I've spoken to private health bosses who say to you, you know, we can't compete with the NHS. It's always better than us. We have to have the, we have to have the, the playing field constantly levelled, constantly rather tipped over in our direction. And then the NHS is a learning organisation. It, it, you look at um, the ISTCs, the I, I, do you remember them? The I cataract operations. Um, they can, we can't compete with the NHS once it learns to do what we're doing. So, the, so all the neoliberal state is there to do is to constantly, actively, proactively enforce marketisation. And it does it insidiously. So a guy who's, or a woman who is supposed to be doing X finds an advisor, and on, on side issue B, the advisor's advice is always market. So what, you, what, what a new social democracy has to start by doing is saying, no more. We're going to switch the engine off. The switch, the, switch off the machine that rips away the public. If you did that, even by a process of, sort of passivity, the public realm, but, and I agree with you, it is the social, the cooperative, the, the associational, it's not just state-ized industries, would recover itself. That's the first thing. And the other thing is, I want to throw into the mix, because we, if we're talking about solutions, is income. You know, if, I don't think the, the, the stagnation of incomes is a tactical thing. I don't think it's a temporary thing. It's given by what I talked about, automation, information technology, the cheapening of, of inputs. Um, and therefore, I think the idea of a basic income uh, which we are paid to, to exist. High-skilled workers are paid to be themselves. I'm not paid to turn up at point A and go home at point B. I'm paid to answer my email at 12 midnight uh, to be, and not leave and, and stick to the company I work for. High-skilled people are paid to just exist and have skills. Everybody should be paid to exist and have the skills they have. And then the basic income idea, I think, is, a time, is an idea that's time, whose time is coming. 
Uh, and I just wanted to throw okay. that. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul. Um, Seamus, I just want to ask you quickly. You, you were critical, well, you were mildly critical of Labour for not being radical enough. Is there any country or politician around the world who you think has got this right, has got the framework right that we need to sort of uh, adopt? Well, I mean, I think it, it, it's interesting that, you know, or even when Ed Miliband made what are objectively quite modest proposals in relation to the energy companies and, um, and land supply for in a public housing building. Uh, I mean, the reaction was unbelievably hysterical um, in both the media and the corporate sector. Um, and if you remember, in the, in the couple of days after that speech was made at the last Labour Party conference, you know, there were, I mean, the, the press was full of stuff about Stalinist, uh, you know, de kulakization and um, uh, as though this was some incredibly radical and dangerous uh, socialist measure that he was talking about. And of course it wasn't remotely, and, and then there was a certain amount of backpedalling because public opinion was so heavily uh, behind it. And I, I mean, I think that goes for a lot of what we've been talking about. One of the things that, you know, is very striking in Britain, but also in other countries, including the US, that public opinion on a lot of these questions is well to the left of the political and media mainstream. I mean, in, on the question of ownership, for example, I mean, the support for the renationalization of utilities, rail, uh, public ownership of banks, uh, is, there's majority support for that throughout Britain and in, in other countries as well. And yet, there's almost no one in the political mainstream that's able to say that. So why is that? It's obviously because of, um, of the social and economic interests which are pulling in the other direction uh, and resisting that. I mean, on the question of models, I, I don't think there is a single model that you can pick up. And that was the point I was trying to make about um, you know, that how previous economic and social models have actually arisen out of particular historical circumstance mm. and didn't come off the shelf. Mm. But I think there are things in Latin America, there are things in China, mm. there are things on the, in the European mainland that are happening, some of which we've referred to, um, which are parts right. of an, a, an as assembling a new way of doing things and a different way of doing things that would deliver you know, a more successful uh, economy, a, an economy that delivered for more people in a way that the existing model simply doesn't. And I think the problem holding it back is the social and economic interests that would, wouldn't would benefit from that. And, the, and, the, and what happened last autumn in relation mm. to... Ed Miliband was a demonstration of that. Great, thank you, Seamus. Right, I'm very keen to go to questions, so if you'd like to ask a question, please put up your hand now. Anyone? Uh, the gentleman over there. Um, thank you. A question for Seamus and Mariana, maybe. Uh, which one is the primeval cause, marketization or financialization, as we've heard tonight? I think that's probably one more for Costas. I'll, I'll ask Costas first and then go to Mariana. Um, I'm not entirely certain what you mean by marketization in this, um, uh, in this context. The typical argument the last uh, uh, few decades has been about uh, the rise of neoliberalism, which has basically lifted constraints on various markets, labor market being one of them, financial markets uh, being another. Um, now, if we start with that, and if we take that as a starting point, then it begins to look as a matter of policy. What has happened to modern capitalism is a matter of policy. One fine morning, a bunch of theorists persuaded a bunch of politicians who then took certain measures, Margaret Thatcher in this country, Ronald Reagan in the United States, and then everything unfolded from that because these politicians put these policies in place. And it's, it's easy to see what this would mean, that uh, all we need is a different bunch of politicians who will put different policies in place, and then it will, it will basically be rolled back. Well, no. It's actually more complex than that. That's why I stress financialization. Obviously, we need different policies in place, obviously. However, the reason why we got deregulation and what you call marketization is actually deeper than that. It has to do with what has been happening in the realm of the productive uh, sphere, the productive sector, in the realm of banks, in the things that I mentioned uh, when, I, when I started. It's actually deeply rooted. Um, so for me, you've got to start with financialization in the way in which I've discussed it. And obviously it's been pro promoted by deregulation and it has actually fostered deregulation itself. Once this new layer of finance emerges, it gets policy capture and it begins to push new uh, measures in place, put, put new measures in place that, 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 that favor its own interests. Uh, but it's, it's, it's actually structural. 
and therefore the policies you need are actually structural, not simply re-regulating finance. Mm. It's actually deeper. It has to do with balance of power and balance of ownership uh, in the economy. Thank you, Costas. Mariana, is that your analysis as well about um, the, the mean, origin? A bit different in the sense that I think it's really problematic how we even use the word market. And I think the most illuminated person ever on this is really Karl Polanyi in his book, The Great Transformation, which is markets from day one, at least the capitalist market. So not the local market, you know, selling fruit on the, on the corner, which has been around you know, thousands of years before capitalism, not international markets, which have also been around for thousands of years before capitalism, but the national market, which is actually what we're talking about, is very recent and it's deeply embedded in social and you know, public policy. Uh, short termism actually allows businesses to you know, get off the hook because they just say, oh, the market pressures, that's why we did this. Well, no, there are choices to be made. And then governments, I mean, coming back to, you know, I don't actually just argue for an entrepreneurial state in the sense of innovation. I kind of use that as a metaphor to talk about this really active role that governments have played in any country that has ever achieved long-run growth. And the problem we have today is governments are becoming stupid. They are outsourcing everything. And any time I see any counter tendency to that, I'm like, oh my God, and I get goosebumps, even like kind of things like, you know, government digital services, which in this country wanted to get its own website so you didn't have to go to Google to find a white paper, you could just go to the government website. What did they do? They outsourced it to who? Circo, um, which cr produced a crap website, static, really bad website, 25 million ripped off the government. And then finally, someone in the BBC was like, Jesus Christ, how depressing is this? You know, let's, you know, get the iPlayer people to go build this thing. They did it, you know, civil work, or what do I call it, civil sector workers? Civil, civil servants. Work. Civil servants, <laughs> you know, built it, government workers, and produced an award-winning website, which not only won the award, not only is costing the government much less, but also, in the meantime, energized that particular agency by bringing in the, you know, the geeks, the IT guys, the knowledge, the absorptive capacity. And so markets as outcomes of these different agents are very different. If you have proper government, if you have a de-indebted uh, household, and if you have businesses who are actually investing their profits in these long-run areas, you know, markets would actually look quite different. And just talking about the market as this boogeyman does not help that. Mm, great, thank you. Uh, let's take another question, this gentleman here. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, my name is Bruce Davis. I'm one of the creators of peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending. So about 10 years ago, we came up with a new way of running a market using people. Um, and I was just wondering, um, the question we asked is what were markets for? But I was wondering, is what's the economy for? Great. That's a very uh, clear and direct question. I think, Seamus, would you like to tackle that one? Well, I mean, I think that goes to the heart of, uh, of what we're discussing, because, you know, the economy, what, what it should be for, is to provide uh, the goods and services for people in a way that they can, you know, in, enhances their lives and provides the things that everybody needs and wants, um, and and gives people a, a purposeful and and enjoyable life. And of course, you know, what the economy is actually run for is the people who own and control it, and. That's the thing we're talking about. You know, wh why is there unemployment in the economy? Why is uh, there, you know, this huge inequality that's exploded across the world in the last uh, generation? You know, there are, there are all sorts of technical and other explanations, but actually it doesn't have to be like that. And so there are interests that are involved in that. That's why I was focusing on that point, because I think the social interests that lie behind that, like, and lie behind what Marianne was just talking about, the unbelievable drive to outsource and privatize mm. almost everything of the uh, public services you know even though the evidence on you know what that cost to the public purse what that uh, you know the inefficiencies mm -hmm. the lack of transparency the impact on people's living standards the workforce for, for those companies you know is pretty clear I mean there, there was an amazing figure about PFI uh, in, a, in a House of Commons report about, about 18 months ago that you know in PFI contracts over the previous decade uh, a, f a 50 billion pounds worth of PFI contracts, they would have cost 20, they cost 25 billion more because of the extra expense mm -hmm. in, in private borrowing than they would if the, if the state had done them directly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about very deep-seated uh, interests which you know, are preventing the economy delivering what it could do for people, not only here, in many other countries. And we've got the situation right now in the aftermath of this crisis, of this model that we're talking about, uh, where the British economy, you know, th there's this huge cash mountain which the private sector is, uh, you know, refusing to invest. 
you know, the government could mobilise that, that uh, cash for investment. It's not doing that. You know, productivity is stagnating or falling. You know, so the ability of people with the technology that we have to produce the goods and services, to develop the economy, to develop in a sustainable way, is just not happening. It could be happening, but because of the way this economy is organised, it, it isn't. And so I think that's, you know, that's what, what is the economy for? I think we all know what it's for, really. Uh, the question is, why isn't it delivering for the majority of people, and not just in Britain, but all over the world. And, you know, there are so many things that could be done. Uh, not, some of them relatively modest reforms, but aren't being done. And that's the real, you know, the question for this, what we're debating today, you know, how to Together. deal with the post-crash economy. You know, you've got to focus on that, I think, because that is a pressing question for people here and everywhere. Great. Okay, Paul, I know you wanted to come on, on this question. What's yeah. the economy for? Well, just because I, I think that um, the answer to that given by marginalist economics in the late 19th century goes to the heart of what the divide is or should be in politics. Because the founders of, of neoclassical e economics said the market is the best expression of rationality. That is, billions of rational decisions add up to a collective rational decision. They overtly rejected the idea that any laws of economics could be working behind the backs of the people making the decisions. That is, my rational decision leads to society's rational decision, to rational allocation. Now, I think those of us who just reject that and say there are objective laws to economics that work behind, behind the intention of individual people mean that markets lead to irrational outcomes. But when we said that, our only or in the 20th century, our only solution was to impose rationality through hierarchical and centralized means. And we know that the one massive experiment in those hierarchical and centralized means went wrong disastrously and was worse by its end to what the market, than what the market had produced. I would accept that. Not by its middle, but by its end. And that is, I've told the Soviet Union. So what excites me about what you do, and what I said before about peer-to-peer, -peer, modular, non-managed, free, shareable stuff, is that it reinserts granularity into the narrative of anti-capitalism. That we can exert the rational will of humanity, not through market decisions, not necessarily through hierarchical top-down planning decisions, but through networks. Networks, to me, are smarter than hierarchies, and we have not yet begun the experiment in organizing society in a mixture of planned organization, markets, and networks. But to me, that is the, that is the building block. Mm, thank you very much. Let's, let's go to another question. This gentleman here? Oh, is this from Twitter, is it? Yeah, okay. Is Not actually from Twitter. <laughs> Not from Twitter itself, no. <laughs> let's hear what Mr. Twitter wants to say. Comment. From someone unpronounceable on Twitter. Ace Manry, Ace Manari on Twitter. Um, so, building on what you said about this being, uh, well, consumption being an arena for opposition, if we're in a post-industrial society, why aren't people using boycotts more as the key political act? Why aren't they? Why aren't they? Aren't they? I kind of think Paul, I think well, that's I, quite I, a lot of I've just said a lot of stuff, so I'll just say one thing. Um, I think they are. I think they are. And, and those of us who also, you know, mastermind specialist subject being the, being the history of the labor movement, the labor movement, for example, in America, what as it was at its most successful, in the 1880s and 90s, when it wasn't just a productivist movement, you know, the, the Knights of Labour boycotted businesses they didn't like, boycotted newspapers who ran adverts for businesses they didn't like, and tore the newspapers out of the hands of the street boys selling them uh, when you tried to do it. That, is, that soon shut up quite a lot of people. Um, yeah, I mean, boycotts are a thing. Boycott things you don't like, it's good. Yeah, and Costas, do you see, do you see this uh, activism happening? I think we need to be a little <coughs> bit uh, more careful about this than, uh, than it appears to me we've done so far, in the sense that obviously things have changed, and obviously the way in which uh, profits are made uh, appears to be different now to, and that's what I've argued myself, to, to, to 40, 50 years ago. But still production is the, the defining moment. Uh, of contemporary capitalism. Industry remains very important, even in the most mature uh, financialized countries. The key point about this is that it has financialized itself. Mm -hmm. right? It isn't that we don't have any industry anymore. We do, we've got plenty of that, but it has financialized uh, and it has been transformed. So the way in which um, opposition develops to all these phenomena we see 
must be connected to organized labor somehow, I would argue, to production, obviously must start from that, but we also need uh, all the other things that uh, Paul mentioned. Here I would like to make one final point, which is this. You know, marketization was mentioned previously. Actually, we've got to be, we've got to be more careful with that too. There is no, there is no invariant uh, tendency towards marketization. There, capitalism doesn't simply marketize everything. That actually doesn't work quite uh, that way. And Paul's points about the internet and so on are very important there. The internet has actually demonetized, demarketized things, instinctively, uh, uh, automatically, without anyone planning it. Newspapers. I don't know how you read the newspapers, but I read them off the um, computer. I don't buy them anymore. <laughs> or at least I don't buy as many as I used to. Now, I know I've got to spend a bit of money to buy the computer, but then if I bought the computer, I can do all sorts of things with it. And one of the things is to, one of the things is to read the newspapers. And the, uh, the members of the panel who, whose livelihood <laughs> depends on this have suffered as a result. Music. Now, I don't know how to do it, my, but, but my daughters are very good at it. So they, <laughs> so they, they, they have uh, effectively demonetized it. <laughs> and they don't ask me for any money for that. So, uh, so, so, so the system itself and the way the world works, technology, the forces of production, to use an old-fashioned Marxist term, works in a, work in a peculiar way. And, and the calculus of what is a market and what is not shifts um, constantly. People themselves also do it in the sense that if commercial money, and the usual pound and the dollar, oppresses your life, <clears throat> and it does, then you find a way of bypassing it. And what do you do? Yeah, well, you establish the, 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 the green pound or the green dollar. You establish, you establish lets. You find a way of excluding it. Right? And you find a communal and associational way of transacting that actually keeps the market at bay and you work on the basis of services provided and goods directly exchanged. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is the answer to all our problems. Of course, it, it, it cannot be that. Nonetheless, we do see it. We do see it happening, right? So that, again, is an indication of society um, opposing marketization mm -hmm. consciously, uh, as well as marketization being undermined by the development of uh, yeah. technology and production. Thank you, Costas. So we think we've got time for just one more question. This gentleman at the back here has had his hand up. Thank you. Um, uh, just picking up on what Paul was talking about, about the um, digital economy and particularly peer-to-peer -peer transactions as a way to deliver a more equal society, I just wondered whether at the minute actually the kind of peer-to-peer -peer stuff is actually seen as something for the rich and for the elite. So I'll give two examples. One, the, probably the f most famous example of peer-to-peer, -peer, um, other than Wikipedia, um, which is a great thing, but the other example is uh, Airbnb, which is you know a, a really high, highly profitable company that allows people with spare bedrooms to uh, to you know sell them for more. The other um, thing is um, the only, as far as I know, the only um, peer-to-peer sort of uh, company or internet service with a government subsidy is peer-to-peer. Uh, angel investing on equity crowdfunding websites. So I just wondered whether there's a danger, even though I, under, I get the arguments that actually um, it, it's getting a bad, it might get a bad label. Hmm. Well, I don't know, Mariana, would you like to come in that? You talk about private equity and the role of that in... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a, not a pessimist, what's the word, maybe an old fogey with when it comes, I mean, part of it is just ignorance, I must admit. I don't know enough, but the little I know, I just don't think we're talking about figures that are actually of any massive relevance. So, you know, crowdfunding, it's peanuts. It really is peanuts. And when it does one day even become, you know, a fifth of the kind of funding that was required to produce, and I don't want to sound like someone who's obsessed with technology, but, you know, we do know, I mean, it's the one thing economists actually agree on, that, you know, different types of investments in, in these general purpose technologies, which include mass production, electricity, you know, and the internet, the green tech stuff today, we just don't have private finance going into those areas and peer-to-peer -peer crowd financing just doesn't make a dent. This is why I mentioned these public investment banks which are making a massive dent and what's interesting is also again this risk-reward relationship coming back actually to the state coffers which can then fund the health care, the education, in the case of Brazil, the favelas. Um, so that kind of stuff to be honest gives me lots of goosebumps whereas I just still haven't managed to get a goosebump from the peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah. Do you want to give me some goosebumps? <laughs> 
without any government subsidy. So there is no tax advantage doing peer-to-peer -peer lending at all. You can't even net off your losses like a bank does. Um, so we've done it from zero to a billion pounds. When we get ISA, then we will stop subsidizing the very interests that you've all described mm -hmm. with your own money. It's your money, by the way. 250 billion of it sitting in cash ISAs in banks, subsidizing the very banks we're talking about, by the way, um, with very cheap money, less than 1%, and 250 billion in stocks and shares ISAs, which you are required to invest in FTSE companies. Now, we are arguing that you should spread that into the areas of the economy that are about trying to produce a fairer society. Now, we're slowly winning the argument, but trust me, there are a lot of vested interests in you not moving that 400 billion pounds that you've got sat in your pockets and putting it into something useful. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, sadly, that's all we've got time for. We've had an extremely stimulating discussion of very wide-ranging uh, topics, lots to think about. Um, thank you very much for coming. The speaker's books, Costas' new book, uh, Profiting Without Producing, I think will be on sale outside, and also some of the other panellists' books. Um, so finally, uh, if you'd just join me in thanking our panel, uh, Costas Lapovitsas, Paul Mason, Mariana Matsukato, and Seamus Milne. Thank you. Thank you.